Hi all, Mike here again. Welcome to the latest episode of Heightened Curiosity. This time, we're going to tackle the extremely controversial subject of UK Bigfoot or UK Wildman. I say controversial as anyone who studies or researches a Bigfoot phenomenon in a serious fashion would more than likely have issues with the idea that Sasquatch could be indigenous to the British Isles. Before we get into the debate and take a much closer look at the subject, I'll explain my own interest in the whole Bigfoot hoo-ha. As you may be able to tell, I'm from the UK, Scotland to be exact, so why would this subject capture my attention in such a pronounced manner? As touched upon in our last episode, where we looked at my own personal experiences of a UFO nature at a Scottish Air Force base, but I'm more than happy to recap here. As a kid, I loved books which covered supposed real-life mysteries and the alleged unknown. Sasquatch or Yeti often played a prominent role in these books, and the idea that something monstrous but also very human-like could be wandering in parts of the US wilderness appealed greatly to me. Another huge factor was the Charles Pierce and Earl Smith's legendary 1972 docufilm The Legend of Boggy Creek. I remember watching this movie when I was maybe around 10 years old as BBC here in the UK showed the movie a few times in the early 80s. I was both terrified but also fascinated as I slowly made the connection between the creature portrayed in the film and the Sasquatch animal discussed in those mystery books I was consuming at an impressive rate. Scotland I guess also has its connections, albeit some may be tenuous with the Sasquatch phenomenon. John Muir, the famous naturalist who was instrumental in setting up national park areas in the USA, areas that include Yosemite Valley and the Sequoia National Park, both of course cited as prime Sasquatch habitat. As many will know, Muir was actually born here in Scotland, in the east coast town of Dunbar, where he is held in high esteem to this day. This is clear if you're ever lucky enough to manage to visit this quaint old fishing town. This incredible man immigrated to the USA at the age of 11 and from men his contribution to the preservation of wilderness areas is the stuff of legend. Another Scottish link to Bigfoot comes from a slightly more unlikely source. I was extremely fortunate to meet my esteemed Dr Jeff Meldrum at a Bigfoot conference in Florida a few years back. During our conversations, Dr Meldrum revealed his fondness for Scotland and his proud Scottish heritage. If I remember correctly, Dr Jeff had traced his surname back to the village of Old Meldrum, which is situated about 20 miles northwest of Aberdeen on the Scottish East Coast. Meldrum also told me that if circumstances had been slightly different, he wouldn't have been at this conference at all. He went on to tell me that as a younger man, he had spent a few years in Scotland and he'd met a girl, and it looked likely for a while that he was going to settle down and call Scotland his permanent home. Unfortunately, or fortunately for proponents of Bigfoot, things didn't quite work out, and Jeff headed back to the States, and once again, Scotland's loss was very much America's gain. As you can imagine, a Bigfoot conference held in Florida was an eye-opener for a Scottish visitor. In fact, I could probably make a full episode about that day alone. I met some very... Let's just say interesting people, but also some great guys too, like Lyle Blackburn, which was a treat for me given my love for the Boggy Creek movie and all the events which happened in Folk, Bill Brock, a researcher who's from Maine, and he was previewing his Underground Monsters TV show, Stacy Brown Jr., who along with his father, filmed possibly the best flare footage of Bigfoot we've ever seen. And also, last but certainly not least, my longtime buddy, Stevie Strings, who is one of the coolest guys in the Bigfoot Sasquatch scene. Please check out Stacey and Stevie's fairly recent documentary, The Skunk Ape Lives. I know it's available on Les Stroud's Survivor Man channel on YouTube, so it should be fairly easy to pick up. Getting back to the Scottish links to Sasquatch, we of course have a famous and fabled Amphiliath Moor, or 
better known as the Grey Man of Ben McDewey. I'll apologise in advance for my terrible stab at the Gaelic language, which is of course native to Scotland. We'll touch on the legend later on, as it's often quoted when serious discussion around the hairy man phenomenon within the UK sparks up. One final Scottish connection to Sasquatch and cryptids is the godfather of cryptozoology itself, Ivan Sanderson. Sanderson was born in Edinburgh in 1911, but his fascination for all things strange really came to light when he settled in the US after the Second World War. His groundbreaking 1961 book, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, the story of subhumans on five continents from the early ice age until today, is a bona fide early classic and set the tone for much of Sasquatch research, which was to come later in the 1960s. Again, allow me to recommend this book as a must read. I'm sure I'll touch more on Sanderson's work in forthcoming episodes. He's a genuine case of being a man ahead of his time, with an interest in most things strange and fortean, not just hairy hominids. Okay, let's get down to the big question to get this one moving. Why do people think that we have Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Unknown Primate, or some of our as yet unidentified hominin or hominid here in the UK? I guess, first of all, we need to go back in time. In Western and Northern Europe, we are aware of the Green Man symbology, which adorned many buildings and graves as a stone carving, and also the many pieces of art, which usually featured a sort of iconic image of a face, either made of or surrounded by leaves or foliage. What the Green Man actually symbolises isn't quite straightforward as it seems, as it seems he means many different things to many different people. The Green Man is more commonly thought to represent a pagan spirit, which demonstrates the rebirth or regrowth of nature during springtime, or sometimes a more general take on man's reliance or link to nature. It's not clear that the Green Man ever reflected a tangible being, but many advocates of UK Bigfoot will point to folklore to suggest that the Green Man myth could relate to something big and hairy, stalking the woodlands of Europe in times gone by. Another often quoted historical figure in UK Bigfoot lore is the Woodwoods. The term Woodwoods translates roughly from the old English language as the wild man of the woods. Now depictions of the Woodwoods do actually suggest a hirsute or hair covered man normally wielding a club. I use the term man as most artist impressions are heavily on the human side of the spectrum. There is a suggestion from UK Bigfoot proponents that the Woodwoos could actually be the last remaining tribe of Neanderthals or potentially a similar surviving offshoot. Some UK sightings describe a smaller, more human than primate entity, which is a caveman type appearance. There are several other wild men type legends connected to the UK. But these are mostly folklore featuring more in the way of little people like the brownie, the imp, the trolls, etc. We could get bogged down in the multitude of stories and mythology of the British Isles, but let's cut to the chase and focus on the big guy and not his little cousins. So, where did all this UK Bigfoot business begin? Well, it seems it's a fairly modern construct, despite the historical connections to the Green Man and the Woodwoos we previously mentioned. I had heard of cases being reported from the infamous Canic Chase hotspot as far back as the mid to late 1990s, maybe? As mentioned in a previous episode, I was in contact with some like-minded researchers who hailed from the Midlands area of England, and these sightings uh, cropped up in correspondence, although at the time, They were more in relation to the UFO goings on in that area. The link between UFOs and Bigfoot certainly isn't something new. Um, And I think I also remember reading a case reported by a family who were visiting a new forest, which is situated in the county of Hampshire in the south of England, maybe around the year 2000, something like that. Um, It's a... 
It's a sighting I can no longer find anywhere, but it seems their day out was apparently spoiled by a seven foot tall creature covered in reddish hair who was running through a forest at a speed of around 60 to 70 miles an hour. We described it moving at the speed of a fairly fast car going down the motorway. Interesting. Next up on this episode of Heightened Curiosity, UK Bigfoot Fact or Folly, we'll cast our eye over some of the more contemporary incidents and hotspots which have helped shape the UK Bigfoot scene as it is now. Okay. The first UK Bigfoot activity we'll take a much closer look at are the Bolham Lake incidents which occurred around the year of 2002. We'll also cast an eye over the follow-up work carried out by researchers at the relatively nearby Harwood Forest. These incidents which took place in the northeast of England garnered a fair amount of media attention at the time and seemed to be the catalyst for the first wave of the UK Bigfoot movement. Bolham Lake Country Park is situated around 20 miles northwest of the city of Newcastle. The story began towards the back end of 2002 when some pike fishermen reported seeing a creature which chased them down a wooded pathway. There are various versions of what we saw that night, with the most common observations being that it was 8 foot tall, had red sparkling or glowing eyes, and strangely sharp teeth. Interestingly, the sharp teeth detail is often removed from many of the reports for reasons which aren't always fully clear. One thing led to another, and the story appeared in the local press. It soon caught the attention of John Downs, an English-based researcher affiliated to the Centre of Fortean Zoology. John quickly set up an expedition a few weeks later. The investigations again attracted the attention of the local and national media, and suddenly the idea that UK could be home to Bigfoot type creatures was suddenly being presented to the folks of the British Isles. During John Downs' investigations, he reported that there seemed to be interference with his electrical equipment and noted that unexplained failures were common. On one of the days, one of the expedition team reported that they saw a large figure close to the Bolton Lake car park. And a short time later, five of the group, including John, saw a large figure running through the woods from a distance of around 150 feet. It was dark, but the figure was captured in the headlights of the cars owned by the group. The team, as you can imagine, were excited by the sighting, although unfortunately no photographs or video evidence was captured. Now, Bolham Lake is a site worth taking a closer look at. The lake itself is artificial and was constructed in 1817 along with the attached woodland. It was built for the local lord of Bolham. However, much later, Northumberland Council purchased the lake and some of the woodland in 1972 for use as a public country park. The park is popular with visitors throughout the year, be it dog walkers, picnickers, fishermen, etc. There is a visitor centre with a small cafe and canoeing is allowed during the spring and summer months. A quick glance at the map shows just how small the woodlands surrounding the lake are. The woodland area covers only approximately 100 acres in total. Despite its small size, the park is serviced by three car parks to cope with the relatively large number of visitors. The woodland area of the park, which provides cover for the eight foot tall beast with huge sharp teeth, is intersected by the car parks, the cafe, the visitor centre and the picnic area. The possible habitat connected to Bigfoot sightings has always been problematic in the UK. The Bowen Lake case is unfortunately a prime example of this. Harwood Forest is the next area which came under scrutiny from UK researchers. Harwood is located some 10 miles northwest of Bowen Lake. To this day, the location is regarded as a wild man hotspot, with a multitude of YouTube, vids, and Facebook updates being posted from the area. UK researcher Neil Young took a photo of a distant blob squatch and some very dubious looking footprints. Harwood Forest is, however, substantially larger than the Bowen Lake location we looked at previously, with a size of around 8,000 acres maybe seven miles long and approximately four miles wide. By UK standards, Harvard Forest is pretty sizable. However, ancient forest, it certainly is not. 
The area originally was a mix of open moorland, farmland and purchase estate. The forest has grown in size over the last 90 years or so and is managed by the UK Forestry Commission. If the UK wild man is using Harvard Forest as its home, then it's relatively a recent occupant. The Finding Bigfoot episode, which was filmed in the UK, featured a recreation of one of the Boehm Lake sightings and Harvard Forest was chosen as a location for one of the nighttime investigations. On the subject of Finding Bigfoot, there is no doubt the show was a catalyst for an uptick in the interest in the Sasquatch subject here in the UK. Facebook research groups cropped up and more sighting reports were being circulated. The burgeoning UK phenomenon was also finding favour with British tabloid media, with multiple, mainly sensationalist articles covering some of the more incredible sightings which were being reported at the time. I was aware that this activity was taking place, but I'll be honest, I was not giving the subject much credence as some of the claims and the press coverage at the time I found to be fanciful at best. One of the sightings which gained significant attention was Deborah Hatswell's close-range encounter which took place in Salford, near Manchester, in 1982. Deborah was walking with her friend through a local park when a seven-foot-tall, four-foot-wide ape-man lurched at them from nearby bushes. Deborah, who was 14 years old at the time, fled, leaving her friend behind. Deborah, who went on to form the BBR, the British Bigfoot Research Facebook group, maintains that there has been sightings reported from the very same park previously, back in the 1960s, and she also points to much more recent reports from the same location. As with the Bohm Lake incidents, it's important we take a closer look at the site of Deborah's report. A shining eye on where Deborah saw her huge UK wild man is pretty revealing. I mentioned before that Salford is near Manchester, and when I say near, I really should say that Salford is a suburb attached to Manchester. For those unfamiliar with this part of the world, Manchester is one of the largest cities in the UK with a population of over a half a million people. The population of the Greater Manchester area, which includes the suburbs and surrounding satellite towns, is close to 3 million people, set out over a massive urban area of 115 square kilometres. Salford itself has a population of a quarter of a million people and Beale Hill Park where Deborah had her encounter is positioned in the heart of Salford, just two and a half miles away from Manchester city centre as the crow flies. The park is a typical local park you would find in any UK city or town. It's 86 acres in size and is mostly open parkland with trees and bushes spotted around. The park is sandwiched between the six-lane A6 motorway, 500 metres to the north, and the four-lane M602 motorway, 500 metres to the south. The immediate area is surrounded by dense housing, shops, hospitals, schools, etc. It's about as urban as you can imagine, and the most unlikely location for an up-close and personal encounter of a Sasquatch, even by UK standards. Of course, I'm not here to dismiss Deborah's experience. It's clearly something that's had a lasting effect on her still, almost 30 years later. Deborah is still active on the UK Bigfoot scene, although it seems that the BBR has undergone some changes recently, flipping from the British Bigfoot Research Group to the intriguingly titled Being Believed Research and Investigations. This new group have widened their scope and are currently chasing weird and wonderful cryptids the length and breadth of the British Isles. One of my favourite recent posts on their Facebook page was a report from a horrified dog food factory worker who saw a seven foot tall telepathic alien mantis while cycling home. This of course was again covered by what passes for a news outlet in the UK these days. It's unclear if the guy making the report was trolling or maybe suffering the effects of the elongated lockdown here in the UK. Either way, I found it highly amusing nonetheless. The next case we look at means we return to my homeland of Scotland. At the young age of seven, Charmaine Fraser saw what she firmly believes to be a Bigfoot. While watching an episode of Finding Bigfoot, yep, those guys again, Charmaine noted similarities between her experience 30 years ago and what a witness was retelling on TV. 
Again, Charmaine's encounter was covered by the press, and given that the sighting was in Scotland, I took the opportunity to drop Charmaine an email back in 2015. I asked about her sighting, and had offered some assistance where I could. However, it soon became clear to me that my sceptical standpoint would be at odds with what was happening in the realm of the UK Bigfoot scene at the time. Again, we find the location of Charmaine's sighting is somewhat problematic. It occurred near the village of Carmyle, which lies around 6 miles or 9 kilometres to the west of the small Scottish town of Arbroath, which is situated within the county of Angus on the east coast of Scotland. The land in this part of Angus is prime farming country, with only smatterings of woodland breaking up the miles and miles of farmland and fields which make up the bulk of the county. You may of course be aware of the famous Aberdeen Angus breed of beef cattle which originates from this part of Scotland. I am aware that Charmaine does make a point that the area where she had her sighting may have had slightly more tree cover when she had her encounter back in the early 1980s, but there is no indication that the area could have been viable Sasquatch habitat, especially given the lack of other sightings in the area and the lack of connected folklore for which us Scots are renowned. Who knows what Charmaine saw all those years ago, but again, there is no doubt it left a strong impression. I believe that Charmaine is also involved in the UK or Scottish Bigfoot scene, and we wish her luck with her future investigations. The UK sightings all seem to share significant issues in regards to location. There are, however, some sizable forest locations here in the UK which would, could be considered possible viable habitat for a large animal. Both the Galloway Forest and the Caledonian Forest situated here in Scotland are not only large, but are partly old growth, ancient woodland, which is said to be the favoured environment for Bigfoot. From a wildman perspective, the Caledonian Forest seems to be a much more interesting candidate. We know the forest is home to brown bear up until the 6th century, when hunting and loss of habitat drove them to extinction. The forest is located in the Scottish Highlands, where it is now split into 35 separate remnants, covering approximately 180 kilometres in total. Interestingly enough, from a Sasquatch perspective, at least some of the Caledonian forest skirts the Cairngorm mountain range. One of the peaks here is the infamous Ben McDewey, the home of the aforementioned Grey Man. Any investigation into UK or Scottish Bigfoot isn't complete without having a closer look at Am Fear of Moore, or as you may know him, the Grey Man of Ben McDewey. Ben McDewey is the second highest mountain peak in the United Kingdom, it's part of the Cairngorm mountain range, situated in the heart of the highlands of Scotland. Its summit elevation is 1309 metres, or 4,295 feet. It's situated around 10 miles, or 16 kilometres, from the nearest town of note, which is Aviemore. The first recorded run-in with the Grey Man took place back in 1891. The encounter was related to the members of the Cairngorm Club. The Cairngorm Club is an Aberdeen-based mountaineering club said to be the oldest in Scotland, forming way back in 1887. One of their members, the renowned Professor J. Norman Colley of University College London, told the following tale to his fellow members back in 1925. I was returning from a cairn on the summit in a mist, when I began to think I heard something else and merely the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after me but taking steps three or four times and not the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again but I could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on, and the eerie crunch, crunch, sounded behind me, I was seized with terror, and took to my heels, staggering blindly amongst the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down to Rothy Marcus Forest. Make of it what you will, I do not know, but there was something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey, and I will not go back there again myself. 
October 1943, naturalist and mountaineer Alexander Tunin also had a dramatic encounter with something that terrified him on the mountain. Tunin heard footsteps in the mist and claimed to see a strange shape loom up and charge at him. He fired his revolver at whatever it was, then ran down the path at speed to safety. We note in the case of both of these famous incidents that a Bigfoot type creature was not reported by either witness. Other sightings have been in the same vein, as what is reported to be footsteps heard or strange shapes being seen in the mist. The location of these sightings wouldn't offer any purported Sasquatch much in the way of cover, as the mountain is devoid of foliage or tree cover for miles around. Explanations for events which are linked to the Grey Man range from infrasound, which can be generated by the wind. This is given plausibility by the large numbers of visitors to Ben McDewey who find the place to be somewhat unsettling and eerie. These feelings can be compounded by exhaustion and isolation felt by climbers or hikers visiting one of the most beautiful, but also one of the most inhospitable places in the British Isles. Science has also attempted to explain the reports of a large figure seen on the mountain. Some of these reports speak of a figure of enormous size, reaching 20 to 30 foot tall. These giants are said to be a result of an optical illusion known as the Brocken Spectre. This is when, in certain atmospheric conditions, a person's shadow can be projected onto a low nearby cloud bank, creating the illusion that a large, shadowy humanoid figure is nearby. Poet James Hogg was terrified by one of these beings back in 1791. But Hogg's terror dissipated, however, when he noted that the 30 foot tall apparition was actually making the same gestures as he was. Allow me to relate one more sighting from this area, which certainly caught my attention at the time. 12 miles or 19 kilometres due north of Ben McDewey lies at Abernethy Forest, which is one of the remnants of the aforementioned Caledonian Forest. Back in 2012, Al Smith and his brother went on their yearly camping, fishing and hunting trip. That year, they had chosen the Abernethy Forest as their base. The brother set up camp and rose early at 4am the next day to make the most of her trip. Al had got up, put on his camel gear and then put on a pot of coffee before he and his brother made their way to the tree line and investigate their surroundings. Al had soon noticed that he couldn't hear his brother behind him anymore. He turned to see that his brother was standing still with his eyes open and his mouth agape. About 50 feet away from him, was a black figure crouched down apparently eating berries from a bush. The creature seemingly then heard the brothers and stood up to full height, which was seven to eight foot tall. It turned to look to see who had disturbed it, and Al describes the creature as being covered in jet black hair except for its upper chest and face. He reported that the face reminded him of an older bonobo chimpanzee, but with perhaps a flatter mouth. It was around four foot across, so undoubtedly an extremely large, imposing figure. The creature and Al looked at each other for a while, until finally the animal walked off back into the trees. Al reports that he wanted to stay and have a closer look, but his brother was already dismantling their camp and made it clear he was leaving. Al said that the sighting had such a profound effect on his brother that he'd sold all his camping and fishing equipment and the brothers now no longer speak to each other, which is unfortunate as corroboration of the tale would have been invaluable. The sighting is held in high regard by the UK Bigfoot community, uh, mainly because Al Smith, or Hillbilly Al, as he is known, is purported to have worked at a number of zoos in the UK as a primate keeper. The logic, of course, determines that Al would be in a better position than most to identify what he saw and would be a fairly credible witness. I cannot attest to any of these assertions, but places reports into an echelon the bulk of UK reports would fail to reach. As with the other sightings we've looked at, we'll take a closer look at the location for the Abernethy Forest sighting report. The Abernethy National Nature Reserve is managed by the RSPB, which is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. The reserve is over 120 square kilometres in size, with around 40 square kilometres of forest within the reserve itself. The park is popular with walkers and wildlife enthusiasts, 
and attracts thousands of visitors throughout the year. The forest has been utilised as a source of timber for centuries, so it's never really been a genuine wilderness area as such. The Alsmith sighting is all report from a forest I could locate, which given the ease he managed to get fairly close and the reported size of a creature he saw, certainly makes it difficult to assert there's a population of these animals using the forest as their home. Next up we'll move on to discuss the evidence that the UK Bigfoot community has presented while searching for this highly elusive animal. As mentioned before, there's been a fascination within UK tabloid media for stories relating to Sasquatch wandering around the British woodland. A whole host of videos and pictures have appeared in newspapers and online claiming to show proof of a UK Bigfoot. These images and video range from the ridiculous to the truly absurd. The whole gamut of dreadfully executed hoaxes to some of the best examples of blob squats you can imagine. Anyone watching our YouTube upload of this episode, which has video and images uploaded alongside the audio, will currently be spoiled with the quality of excellent UK Bigfoot evidence I'm currently showing. Whilst researching this show, I've been looking for something that could be even vaguely interesting from an evidence standpoint. But so far, I've drawn a blank. If anyone can help in this regard, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. We've looked at the sightings. We've looked at the um, evidence. Now let's look at the UK in general as a viable habitat for the wild man or Bigfoot of the flesh and blood variety. Now we've gone into some detail about habitat when discussing various sightings we've looked at and clearly there are issues that cannot be ignored. To compound these problems, we also have another issue when we try to determine what UK Bigfoot actually is. Whilst we get British reports of regular 7 to 8 foot tall hulking beasts, many Bigfoot proponents argue that the wild man native to these shores aren't these types of creatures at all, but a smaller woodwoos type animal which is maybe 5 to 6 foot tall and more human like in terms of build. There is also a train of thought that the UK wild man is maybe some type of Neanderthal, which has gone undiscovered so far. There are also other anomalies where people are reporting smaller beings such as three foot tall, golden mane men of Errington Woods and the four foot tall monkey man of Churston Woods, which was sighted in Torbay. Having such a diverse range of Bigfoot type species is certainly problematic. I think that most of us struggle to comprehend that the British Isles is home to a breeding population of just one species of flesh and blood Bigfoot or wild man, never mind a whole host of competing populations of Bigfoots, Woodwoos or Neanderthals which come in all shapes and sizes. UK Bigfoot blogger Andrew McGrath is a strong proponent of Bigfoot being alive and well here in the UK. He often likes to use British land use statistics to assert the clear reality that wild men are among us. Indeed, he calls the suitable habitat argument a misnomer or a Mandela effect, which is an interesting take to put it mildly. Andrew seems to be looking at the data in reverse, pointing out that the UK has only 10.6% urban landscape across the whole of its landmass, which may be surprising to some, but what we need to scrutinise is the remaining 89.4%. What percentage of this could be viable Bigfoot or Woodwoo's habitat? Professor Alistair Ray from Sheffield University's Department of Urban Studies and Planning created a land cover atlas of the United Kingdom back in 2017 using the 2012 Corrine Land Cover Dataset. Taking a closer look at this, um, we can look at the top six categories by area. Pastures and non-irrigated arable land are by far the largest, which you will have guessed already are of course farm use in the main. We also have peat bogs, which make up a surprising 9.4%, moors, heapland, natural grasslands, and finally, discontinuous urban fabric, which of course make up our cities, towns, and suburban areas. These top six classifications alone make up 84% of all UK land use. I don't have to make too strong an argument that UK Bigfoot hunters wouldn't have too much success in any of these environments. 
So what does that leave in terms of genuine potential wildman habitat? Well, 5.1% of the UK is carnivorous forest. We've touched on the issues relating to areas of British pine, given that much of the land is new growth and is being actively managed by the UK Forestry Commission. Only 2.1% of the UK landmass is classed as broadleaved forest, and both the Woodland Trust and the National Trust here in the UK lament the loss of what is termed ancient woodland. With almost half of this precious land being lost over the last hundred years or so, and currently it only makes up 2% of, of the total UK woodland. This is of course terrible news to report, and it's a state of affairs that we cannot see improving anytime soon, unfortunately. The Woodland Trust rightly points out that the UK is one of the least wooded countries in Europe, with less than 12% of the landmass covered by trees. In comparison, Finland has 72% cover, and more surprisingly, countries such as Spain and Portugal have almost treble the amount of forest as we do. The data also displays other stark comparisons, showing that the UK only has 28,000 square kilometres of forest area, but its neighbour France has 247,000 square kilometres, almost 10 times as much. As much as England is often described as a green and pleasant land, its lack of forest and woodland is lamentable. Unfortunately, this does not bode well for potential for the UK to harbour multiple, active, viable populations of wild men, no matter what shape or size they are purported to be. It's a long-held argument whether the UK is home to genuine wilderness. For most Sasquatch researchers, this would be the ideal environment for those creatures to survive. Can we generally compare the most viable habitat in the UK, such as the Galway and Caledonian forest, to places such as Kainu Forest in Finland, the Carpathians, or the Biowaza Forest in eastern Poland, where bears, wolves and elk make their home? As far as I'm aware, these magnificent places don't claim to host wild men, despite being much better candidates than the comparatively small patches we have here in the UK. As well as making bold claims about the UK being a perfect place for Bigfoot to thrive, the aforementioned blogger and McGrath also managed to make tabloid newspaper headlines himself, with, believe it or not, more bold claims. Incredibly, Andy also had a terrifying Bigfoot encounter whilst out jogging in his local park. While stateside, it's common for researchers not to have a visual sighting despite dedicating years to the study. Here in the UK, however, it seems if you look for Bigfoot, you will find Bigfoot. Viable habitat for UK Bigfoot has always been an issue. But what about the sightings? What are people saying? Are we all mistaken? Are we all making it up? Have we all got squatching on the brain? It's a difficult question to answer, but one aspect worth raising here is also covered in Nick Redfern's 2007 book Man Monkey in Search of Britain's Bigfoot. Nick also featured in my last episode, but given the relevance of his book, I won't apologise for making reference to him again this time around. His book was written long before the Finding Bigfoot explosion, which has undoubtedly inspired much of what we see taking place in the UK these days. The book centres around sightings at hotspots in the Midlands area of the UK, namely at Bridge 39 on the Shropshire Union Canal and also at Cannock Chase, which of course cannot go without being mentioned in any UK Bigfoot roundup. Nick, like myself, has difficulty with the viability of a flesh and blood Bigfoot existing on the British Isles, but he does suggest that there's a possibility that a phenomena is real in some kind of sense. He points to a possible paranormal or psychological explanation. He reminds us that some of the sightings have taken place close to perceived sacred sites such as old stone circles, ancient burial grounds, bridges, crossroads, ruined castles, and what John Keel of uh, the Mothman Prophecies fame would term window areas. A fascinating hypothesis for sure, and this could explain the event which was reported by Josephine Aldridge on the grounds of Dundonald Castle, which is situated close to Kilmarnock in the county of Ayrshire, Scotland. Josephine encountered what can only be described as a spectral or ghost-like gorilla, which faded away into nothingness after being glimpsed for a few seconds. Many UK Bigfoot reports describe a similar disappearing act, 
which is extremely curious indeed. And it covers more on these strange UK ghost apes on his Mysterious Universe blog, which I'd recommend for further reading. It's here I would also like to point out that John Downs, who was part of a team who witnessed a large shadowy shape at Bolam Lake, is also of the opinion that there could be some kind of paranormal explanation to this mystery. Now, I'm the last person you would normally find referencing woo or paranormal aspects whilst discussing a Bigfoot phenomena. However, it's a prevalent aspect of the UK wild man mystery and I'm happy to add it here in the UK context only. I hope I've managed to shed some light on the possibility of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the wild man or wood woos is hanging around here in the UK. As you can tell, there is a little bit of phenomenon which points to further investigation, which is a great shame for me as I would love nothing more than spending my weekends looking for potential evidence on my doorstep. We've looked at the sightings, the evidence, the history, and the possible habitat, and unfortunately I've not found anything that has piqued my interest. I'm sure that British Bigfoot advocates will point to the UK episode of Finding Bigfoot as some kind of justification, but unfortunately, as fun as the trip was for the guys, it was deemed to be a complete waste of time in terms of actually looking for Bigfoot. Cliff Barrickman points out there was a reason why we had to fill in the episode with a section at Loch Ness. There wasn't much to go on in any of the locations they filmed at, including a night investigation in the Highlands of Scotland. On the subject of Cliff Barrickman, uh, he has actually sent me two Scottish cases to review a while back, one of which is the now famous case of the A925 Roads Roundabout. It's a road crossing sighting near Dundee, and also another one which is much more local to me in the Steps Garkosh area, which is several miles north east of Glasgow. Again, this was another road crossing case, but the description of the location is vague and I couldn't pin down where the sighting would have taken place. This one would certainly go into the problematic location category, however, and I don't think I'll be spending much, if any, energy digging any further into what was reported here. We've managed to cover a lot of ground today. As always, any questions are more than welcome. If you're watching the YouTube version with added visuals, please do the usual and like, subscribe kind of thing, as it would be very much appreciated. Check out our previous episode and look out for our next one, which is going to feature an incredible case of the Robert Glenn Poltergeist. Ghosts, spooks and related phenomena are not my usual bag, but in this case, which is very local to me, is genuinely fascinating, as some of the police reports connected to it are quite startling. But anyway guys, thank you very much for tuning in, and I'll see you all on the next episode of Heightened Curiosity.